Well, good morning. Welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Thank you for joining me. We're in day 21, looking forward to the promise of the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What are we supposed to be doing in the meantime? Well, we're supposed to be uh, examples, not just to the flock, but to the world, to demonstrate the power of the gospel. That's what we're going to talk about today. And for that, there's a great reward a great reward. Listen, we finished up yesterday talking about those seven characteristics of a godly life, as is mentioned in verses five through nine, and how we're supposed to be working to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to demonstrate these things like knowledge and perseverance and brotherly kindness and godliness and the like, self-control. These are all characteristics of a growing Christian. It's how you and I make a difference in the world. But today we get to verse 10, and I'm only going to cover two verses and then cross-reference those a bit so that you understand this passage. It's very important to grasp this principle of the Christian life, the principle of sticking with it, of staying with your faith, knowing that you are generating rewards for the future. You know, many folks are real concerned about their investments these days. I think most of us should be as to whether you are putting your money in a place where you're going to grow some dividends or growth or something for down the road that will make a difference, perhaps give you a reward in retirement. Well, I think, friends, it's all the more important that you think about rewards for eternity. What kind of spiritual investments are you making today? Well, this is what he talks about in verse 10, verses 10 and 11, as he's already emphasized to us what we're supposed to be doing. So he says, therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, notice something here that I have to make mention of because when the little word election pops up, some folks tend to just... Uh, fall off on one side of the turnip truck at this point and say, oh, election, see, I have nothing to do with this. I was uh, picked or not picked before any of this ever started. That It's all just like one big Shakespearean play. God already had made all the actors, painted all the pieces, and he decided who would be picked and not picked before it ever started. And they think that's what election is. No, that's not what election is. Election is something done in Christ, the only personality that will become a human being that was ever pre-existent before the foundation of the world. The secret is in Christ and being in Christ, accepting Christ, the sacrifice of his blood, his atonement applied to your life. And if you'll notice here, it's not a passive word that follows, uh, this, this is not a passive calling and election. Because he said, my brothers, you be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. This is activity that you are doing. In other words, you are nailing down with confidence your faith. You're doing it by growing in the Lord and demonstrating that the Holy Spirit does have the power to change your life and to grow you in Christ. And then in the next verse, again, a verb of action. For if you do these things... <laughs> Then here's what's going to happen. You'll receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, it's not talking about working for your salvation. Oh, no, that's something that's already taken care of. We talked about that in just the first few verses. That is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You cannot work for your salvation. Your salvation was worked for and paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. The cost was high. It was the precious blood of the spotless lamb. You did not possess the ability to make that transaction. You and I did not have the sinless blood within us. Instead, it's something God had to do. But so now what he's talking about is what happens after you become a believer. Now that you are a believer, what are you going to do with this? This is not a singular transaction where you say, oh, I am now saved, I am born again, and therefore I'm on my way to heaven. Don't have to think about this again the rest of my life. I've uh, punched my ticket for heaven. I'm on my way. No, that's, that's not it. That's not it at all. Instead, we're to grow 
in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a process of sanctification. And that's what he's talking about. And here, as he talks about this process, he alludes to the fact that there's going to be reward for growth. There will be reward for growth for believers. So we are working diligently, not only for how we can affect others, but so that we can understand the, the potential for reward in all of eternity for God's children who will be blessed as we have hung in there and persevered through the difficulties of this life. You may be struggling with some of those things now, just like some of us may be having to put on a mask to go do something simple like shop at a grocery store. And you, we think that some of these things are such a struggle. There are friends and relatives you can't see, places you can't go, things you can't do. And we really think that we are suffering because of that. Oh, friends, that's nothing. The fact is, as we face the difficulties of life, especially persecution for our faith, the more we learn to deal with those and grow in God's spirit through these circumstances, the more likely it is that we are not only just surviving, blessing others and passing along encouragement to them, but we are setting aside rewards for all eternity. So to do this, I don't want to continue reading in 2 Peter today. I want to instead do a couple of cross-references because you say, wow, did, did other apostles believe this, writers of the New Testament? Most certainly they did. If you go over to the first epistle of John, Peter's best buddy, or one of the best buddies he had among the disciples, in chapter 2, verse 28, John writes, and now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Of course, the hymn he's talking about is Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, even John. They all talk about the second coming of the Lord. If you get tired of hearing about the second coming, you just have to put your Bible away because the New Testament is full of it. The Old Testament is full of the kingdom that's going to happen when he comes. So throughout the Bible, you cannot get away from the second coming. So John is saying, if you want to really be ready for that coming, you've got to continue in him. So when he appears, you'll be confident and unashamed before him. He even writes in his uh, smaller little first, uh, excuse me, second epistle in verse eight of, uh, of that particular uh, writing. He says, watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully rewarded? Yes, when Jesus comes, he's going to reward his servants. You know, we used to even sing about that in church. It's in some of our hymns. There's a reward coming for those of us who know the Lord and who have taken this faith, not lightly, but seriously, grown in the Lord and discovered how powerful it is, not only for our lives, but to bless others. We think of a passage I won't read today, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you're going to find Paul describing what it's going to be like for a believer's works to be judged before God, that there will be, they will be separated, those good works and the bad works. The bad works, like wood, hay, and stubble, he says, will be tested by fire and they'll just be burned up. Can you imagine realizing that much of the stuff that you've done, the effort that you put forth in this life was not worth anything? And it just disappears when it comes to eternity. Well, that's what's going to happen to some of those works. But he said some of the things you've done really matter for eternity. And they're going to be like gold and silver and precious jewels over here. They're going to last forever. You'll be recognized for those things. Even if no one saw you doing them, God sees all. He understands when you have done something for the right reasons and you're motivated by love and you have given yourself over to serving and serving others and blessing others and sharing in such a way that you're making a difference. It will make a difference for all eternity. Now, Paul does talk about this in a couple of other passages. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. He's talking to believers here. He's not talking about a salvation that can be earned by works. Understand that. No, you're already saved. You're a believer. 
but you're going to come before God, he says, appearing before the judgment seat of Christ so that you can receive. What are you going to receive? Whatever is due you for what you have done with that faith since you've received it, okay? All the things done in your body, whether good or bad. You know, for some of us, that's going to, I say for all of us, to some degree, it's going to be embarrassing to discover we put so much life and effort and work into things that really didn't matter. But you know, the flip side of that is there will be those times where the thank yous will come in, the impact you've had in the lives of others, difference that you've made for all of eternity. That's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. And finally, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, but he has a particular motivation for preaching the gospel, for serving. What does he say? Watch out. If I preach voluntarily in verse 17, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I'm simply discharging the trust committed to me. Now, he's not trying to say, don't pay your preacher. If you have a vocational pastor serving your church and you employ him, of course, he deserves a paycheck. Paul says that over and over throughout the New Testament as well that you're supposed to take care of your pastor. It's not what he's saying, but he's saying, what's the motivation of the pastor? You know, people uh, ask, and I ask guys being ordained in the ministry, I'm like, if there's no paycheck, do you still preach? And if you say no, then you don't get my stamp on your ordination certificate because you see, we don't preach for paycheck. We preach for the gospel and for an eternal reward that's much bigger than what you might get here. So in verse 18, Paul says, what then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. So Paul's saying, you know, I need to make clear to everybody that I am not charging people with some of those priests that were so corrupted in the Roman Catholic Church in the Dark Ages should have read this passage when they began to charge people to see if they could not uh, get their relatives out of purgatory and into heaven. What a scam. What a scam. Well, my friends, look what he's saying. I offer the gospel free of charge. Anybody that charges you for the gospel and says, hey, this, this costs money. You know, you can't get this unless you pay up. That person is not only wrongly motivated, they may be a greedy false prophet. Some of those that Peter is going to talk about later in this epistle. He goes on to say in verse 19, though I'm free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Then he goes on and makes that statement to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To the Greeks, I became like a Greek to win them. To those who were under the law, as, as if I was under the law, whatever I had to do to relate to them, to share Christ. So he goes on to finish by saying in verse 22, to the weak, I even became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. So friends, you and I do get to share in the blessings of the gospel. There is great reward, but only if we continue to grow, as Peter has encouraged us to do, to grow in the Lord, grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord, become mature believers, and to share the gospel and bless others, to be a positive impact on our communities, on our society, and to be able to share the great news in the midst of all the bad news today. That's how you make a difference. That's how you stand up and face the struggle, because we know that past the struggle, there's a hope of a great and a precious and eternal reward for all of us. God bless you. I'll see you again tomorrow right here as we wake up in the Word.